Hello, my name is Yorks Chris and this is Exotic Gang Live. Thank you for joining me on this live stream on this quite bright uh, Sunday evening. So I've not done a live stream like this for a couple of weeks. And the last one I did was before the clocks changed and it was uh, eight o'clock when I've been doing them. So it was pitch black. But now it's uh, nice and bright, although it's a bit, bit overcast, but it's uh, nice and dry out there. I can see through the window. So it's nice to have a bit of daylight at this time of day. And since we last did a, a live, stream, live stream together like this, we've had quite a lot of different types of weather. I know we always talk about the weather, but it's really important when you're growing temperamental exotic plants in the UK and uh, in Northern Hemisphere. So we had beautiful weather. Um, not long ago, was it? Was it just last week? Uh, week four last, we had really warm, sunny weather. Here we had over 20 degrees, I think like 20.1 degrees, and we had about four, five, six days over 15, 16 degrees. So the weather has been really, really nice and everything started to, to grow. The soil warmed up a little bit, a bit of sun, a bit strong at this time of year, and we got banana leaves coming out, Musa Baju, and everything sort of stirring. And then after that, we had some really cold weather. So for the last three or four nights we've had sort of down to freezing and depending where you are in the UK you might have had down to about minus five minus six we've been lucky here we've had minus 0 0.5 I think it was um last night I think it, and then the night before I think it got down to minus 1.5 so we've had you know down to just under sub-zero we've not had any proper harsh cold cold nights we've just had you know just down to zero ish and just dip in below for a couple of sort of minutes to an hour when it got to minus 1.5. So that will have sort of blackened a bit of foliage on some plants. And if you had minus three, minus four where you are, then you will have probably noticed, now you've had a look around the garden, some black leaves and things like gunnera that was emerging and sort of musabaju if they were into leaf already. So it's to be expected at this time of year. We are in, you know, it's spring in the UK and, you know, we do get frosts all the way, depending where you live, in April and May. So it's just one of those things we've just got to live with. Obviously, we try to fleece and uh, put straw in tree ferns and things like that at this time of year to protect the emerging foliage. But it's just, you know, you're going to get some damage and then hopefully when the frosts go, depending again where you live, later in April or into May, then we can go a full steam ahead into summer and have really good growth throughout the rest of the year. And we, then we don't have to worry about frost coming back until hopefully uh, November, December time this year. And we've got all the summer to enjoy before that. So in this week's episode, we're just basically, I'm just here to answer any questions you have about exotic gardening, um, about what I garden and just generally about gardening. So you'll see you've obviously got the normal if you're watching youtube you've got the general uh youtube comment section which comes underneath the video and then you have the live chat option as well and the live chat option is what i'm checking so if there's any questions uh people have posted i'll be seeing them on there and if you want to, to you know ask a question stick it in the live chat and i will do my best to answer as many questions as possible uh between now and eight o'clock so who do we have so far this evening asking questions well we've had a few questions from monstera house hi monstera house i'll be answering your questions soon and we've got uh, vincenzi calzoni we've got red 76 as Marum and joe zimmeran so a few people asking questions already mint cake and dalza as well so i'll be answering those questions so let's get straight into it so First question is from Monstera House. Are there any gardens you're hoping to visit this year? And uh, they're suggesting the Secret Garden of Louth and Oak Barn Cottage, which are both, I believe, open under the NGS National Garden Scheme down in, uh, well, in Louth, the Secret Garden of Louth and Oak Barn Cottage, I think, I think it's Nottinghamshire, uh, not a million miles away. Uh, yeah, they're gardens I've never visited, and I'm hoping to visit at least one of those gardens this year. It's always great to visit other people's gardens, just get ideas, and also just talk about exotic plants and generally in gardening as well. 
Um, I visited quite a few last year after my open garden day. So in September last year, I saw quite a lot of people's gardens. Hopefully I'll do the same this year as well. Um, but the build-up normally, t when I open my garden in August, there's so much work goes into getting the garden ready um, that I don't often have a lot of time to see gardens before that. But then hopefully, as we go through August, September, when the gar exotic gardens are at their best normally, hopefully I'll get to see a few gardens as well. So yeah, I'd love to see both those gardens, and I'll try try to see those. Um, I'm definitely going down to uh, down to London to see a couple of gardens this year. Um, go to Kew Gardens, um, definitely doing that for the European Palm Forum Society meeting. So that'd be great to see everybody and to look at some amazing palm trees inside and outside. And that's in June. Um, and I'll see what else, see what other gardens I get to visit whilst I'm down in London. Um, but yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about Up Barn and the Secret Garden of Louth, so hopefully I'll get to see those as well. Next question, if you could change anything about the layout of your garden with hindsight, what would it be? Um, this is a good question because, you know, if you want to plan a garden from scratch, I've been lucky that I had pretty much a blank canvas and I did you know, I did the measurements of the garden, I planned it out on paper from, you know, end of the house right to the bottom of the garden where everything was going to be. I stuck to it probably about 80-90%. I changed a couple of paths and things, but pretty much I stuck to that plan measurements and everything on that. Uh, and that took about three or four years to get everything sort of laid out. Um, but there are changes I would make to the, to the garden. I think one of them would be where my jabea palm is so i know it's a big palm and it's got a big spread and eventually it will go up above my head height and then i'll have to worry about the foliage but i gave it uh eight foot space so i gave it 2.4 meters by 2.4 meters bed right in the middle of the garden put the palm right in the center and then i you know let the palm grow and it's been great but because i'm pretty tall I'm still getting the foliage sort of in my in my face, and what I'm having to do, especially from the open days, is chop back the foliage so that it's anything that's sort of under six foot tall on the leaves and that stick out more than eight foot or four foot each side of the trunk. I am cutting back the foliage, so it looks a bit strange a palm because it's not got its full potential of its leaves all the way out. I am clipping them back apart from the newest leaves that are more upright so i think in hindsight giving that palm probably a, a little bit more space not too much but i probably ideally give it a good sort of like 10 foot across that'd be better because then none of the foliage would be in anybody's way on the paths because you know the, the leaves can spread out and they're not bigger than you know five foot each way of the trunk so that's what i would probably do if i had to change anything um and if I had more space, I'd make wider paths. I've made very narrow paths for half the garden. First half is sort of sort of eight centimetres, about a metre and a bit across for the paths, which is pretty good. Uh, but once you go over the bridge down the garden, the paths start out at only two foot or 60 centimetres. So very narrow paths, but there's plenty of them to get around. And I've done that to maximise the planting space and just have minimum for literally getting around. And then further down the garden, again, it does widen out, I think, to sort of 70, 80 centimetres for the path, which is a bit better. But that middle section is very tight uh, when you go around the arid beds and the jabea. So if I had more space, I would make them wider. Um, and I might, if I was starting again, I'd probably change it out a little bit just to get round uh, the jabea palm because it is really big. And I shouldn't really be cutting the leaves back like I am, but I'm just having to just to get past the palm. So that's probably what I would change. And I'm just checking the questions still coming through. That is great, and they are. So let's carry on with the questions. Uh, if I had to move house um, and you could only take one plant, which would it be? That's a good question. Um, I mean, probably the palm I sh the plant I should take would be the uh, Trachycarpus aurifilus because it's so rare and it's doing so well in the garden and 
you know, future owners might not uh, want the palm in the garden and they might get rid of it. And because it's so rare, I think it's one that I sort of I should look after. Uh, and if I moved house, I should take. So probably I would take that one, even though the one that gives me the most sort of pleasure sort of watching it grow is the Jabea in the centre and my onset Haniba bananas because they grow so quick, so big and they're easy to look after and so impressive in the garden, especially in summer and autumn. So it'd be a toss up between the, well, the Jubea, if I could get it out, it is pretty big now. The onset Hanevas and the Orophyllus because of its rarity. Um, but there's loads of other plants. I mean, I grow hundreds of different plants, um, but some are easier to move than others. Some get really big and some just don't like moving. I'd have no chance of moving my eucalyptus trees, for instance. Um, but some plants are very happily moved about and I move, you know, that grasses and things are very easy to move about. Okay, next question is, what plant would you never allow in your garden? Um, what plant would I like? Well, I wouldn't want anything that's uh, sort of spreads really really vigorously and doesn't have any good sort of flowers or, or foliage so you know i don't want things like himalayan balsam and i don't want things like japanese knotweed obviously that would be awful if that got in the garden um and a sort of a garden plant that i wouldn't plant would probably be the very very vigorous bamboos so i would never grow sasa bamboos i mean i grow quite a lot of spreading bamboos the fire stack of bamboos um down the bottom of the garden and the middle part of the garden which a lot of people are scared of growing um and i'm happily growing those but i wouldn't plant a sasa or even a pseudo sasa because they just they spread so quickly and so sort of vigorously everywhere they're just an absolute pain to get rid of i've seen them getting towards rivers and water courses and getting out of hand in people's gardens so I'd, i wouldn't even buy a house next to somebody who had a Sasa bamboo, they're, they're just a menace, they just spread so quickly and it's so, so hard to control once they're really established. So that's probably a, a plant I wouldn't have in my garden. Roses are quality streets? Uh, neither, really. I used to, well, I like roses the best out of those two, but I'm a, I'm vegan now, so I don't have any of the nice uh, normal chocolates anymore. Let's have a look what else we've got. So Mint Cake asked a question about hibiscus. Uh, hibiscus, I don't grow hibiscus. The, there's, there's a tropical hibiscus and then there's a thoroughly hardy hibiscus. So two completely different uh, plants in terms of hardiness. I think both come from um, China. Uh, some from the sort of warmer tropical areas of China and some from the temperate areas. So the ones from the temperate areas are bone hardy. You can grow them all over the UK, so you'll have no problem in the northwest. Whereas the tropical ones, you know, you really want to keep them frost free. Again, I don't have any experience growing either of those really, um, so I can't give you much guidance on those. I know they've got beautiful sort of blousy flowers. They can work well in tropical gardens and they work well in cottage gardens because they look, to me, look very much like mallow flowers, which are very, you know, typical cottage plants. You can get them in all colours. You sort of see them in sort of pinks and purples quite often, but then you get the vibrant orange ones and the red ones as well, which can look really, really tropical because they are, some of them are true tropical plants. But they are, like I said, very variable. And you get the very hardy ones as well. So I think if you do some good searches, you'll see that some loads of nice hardy hardy ones for all the UK as well. I know we try to draw, uh, grow plants on the edge and grow plants that are sort of half hardy and tender and see if we can get away with them and we think they're better for the garden because it's more interesting. Well, yes, it is. You know, we do like to have the challenge of growing these plants, but you can very easily get plants that are hardy that look exotic and look tropical. You know, things like the fatsia that we grow because it looks really tropical, but it, you know, it's a hardy plant, but we all pretty much grow it in our exotic looking gardens. With a hibiscus, go for, I'll probably go for a hardy one to see how that goes, see if you like it, and then maybe try the more tender types afterwards. Okay, next question is from Vincenzo Calzone. 
and the question is what is my favorite palm tree any palm in the world regardless of the climate what would it be that's a good question um i like most palm trees you know for the, the stature and the tropical look of the leaves and the trunks i think a palm tree that's hard to beat really is probably the the bismarckia palm with its absolutely amazing silver fan-shaped leaves 3d fan-shaped leaves um stunning blue silver foliage unfortunately you know you can you can buy them in the uk and uh, europe and north america but unless you've got loads of heat they don't grow very well and they won't survive uk winters outside at all and they even struggle to be honest inside in winter because they need a lot of light as well people do get them to get through winter in the uk by bringing them indoors but they're not sort of thriving they're just sort of surviving so it's not a plant I'd ever try in this country, but I've seen them abroad and they're absolutely amazing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google Busy Palm or Bismarckia. And it's absolutely stunning, beautiful, and they get really big. And you'll see some photographs when you Google it. They look, they don't even look real. They look so sort of stunning with their, the foliage. It's so vivid, strong, silvery blue. Uh, they're incredible palms. So yeah, or a lipstick palm might be another one to try with its red stems. It looks sort of like unlike any other sort of palm but again you can get these in the uk sometimes you can grow it from seed again it needs sort of warm tropical conditions so they're quite hard quite you know they're very fussy palms to keep going in the uk especially as we get to winter where the light levels drop uh, and again it's an indoor palm in the uk okay so next question we have is uh, Brungmansias from seed. So Brungmansias, you can grow them from seed, obviously, and cuttings. I've grown them from cuttings many times. I've grown them from tiny seedlings. I've never, I don't think, germinated Brungmansia seeds myself. I don't think I've, I've germinated Datura seeds, which are very similar plants, uh, but not Brungmansia seeds. I think you just basically you need fresh seeds. Uh, there's lots of plants that you can grow from seed that you don't need super fresh seeds you know they can be dry stored for a, a year or two whereas certain plants i think brungmansias fall in this category where you need sort of fresh seeds from to germinate well um, and they have pretty small seeds as well i believe so you need to yeah go for fresh seeds a uh, nice warm propagator and don't put too much compost over them sort of surface so really put a bit of uh, vermiculite over the top and keep them sort of nice even warm temperature and they should germinate well if they're fresh seeds uh, and they grow quickly and if you can't get them to grow from seed then you can you can buy them as plants in the uk pretty much every year a discount uh, supermarkets like lidl sell and aldi sell them every single year for pretty cheap they've been like 199 or 299 for the last sort of five ten years every spring and you, you get them you're not certain what color you'll get you get three or four different colors and only sell and the cheap and then you can propagate your own from from those plants or from garden centers they normally do two or three types as well um, but yeah they easy to propagate really easy from sort of stem cuttings you can propagate them in water or in a hydropod or just uh, in compost as well on a heat mat something like that and they do root very nicely indeed Let's see what else we've got. Got a few more questions coming through. So next question is from Asmarom and it's about Musa Lassio Carpa, which is a banana which is sort of a bit like a Musa and a bit like an onset, sort of in between really. And it's like a, a clumping banana with like yellow flowers or sometimes orange or red flowers in rare rare types, but generally big yellow flowers and some glaucous leaves uh, and the question is um had it had the musa lassio carpa for three years in a container i put it out this year and think it's a bit too early it's shown no sign of life do you think it might be dead i found with lassio carpa that the pretty hardy ish you know they, they can get down to freezing and a bit below obviously you want to bring them in before they get frost ideally and but if they go dormant in winter they can take a while sort of to, to wake up and get going 
moves the badgers much much quicker on set to be honest is much quicker as well but that's a camper for me every time i've had it over winter and let it go dormant it's just taken for absolutely ages to to wake up i think it needs constant heat day and night to sort of start into growth um so i wouldn't give up on it yet at all i've grown them and kept them going as house plants and they've flowered in winter um and that was great sort of slowly grew through winter and i've had them like i said go dormant in winter and then they've come back but i think it's sort of like well into may before they've sort of done a first full leaf here when i sort of put them out after being in the the greenhouse uh, over winter i've got one in the greenhouse right now and it's just unfurling its first leaf and that is on the um, that's actually on a heat bed as well so that's got bottom heat and it's in the greenhouse which keeps at least 10 degrees and it's just now unfurling its first leaf so i think it needs some decent light as well which is finally starting to get so i won't give up on it yet like i said that you know people have got away with down to minus three minus four on these and some people leave them out in the ground and mulch them and they come back year after year in sort of uh more southern counties than where i live so you know i won't give up on it yet give it till to be honest i give it till june when it, with a constant warmth because even in may you know it still can be cold at night even if you have beautiful 20 degree days you can get down to easy five six degrees at night so when you get temperatures you know keeping at 10 or above which is normally june july uh, that's when it should be into proper growth by by then and sort of starting to grow a bit before that so don't give up on it and see how it goes for the next month or two okay next question is from joe zimmerman I'm thinking of getting a, a brighter matter. What size would I go for? I've heard they're very slow, but also that they don't do well if grown in pots too long, so not sure. So I would generally for these go for, don't go for seedlings if you've got a bit more money to spend. Go for a plant with a decent sized trunk if you can get it. Um, I wouldn't go for a massive old plant that's been sitting about for ages that hasn't sold in a nursery because when you get a really massive old palm or well, looks old it might not be that old but you know one that's got a substantial trunk that can take a while to get going in your own garden so you might be waiting three four years for it to really get into to growth and acclimatize your garden conditions so i would go for something in between so go for a trunk if you can get one sort of you know so you can can't get your hand around the trunk basically so it's big you know big enough trunk that you can't get your hand around but not something that's in a huge massive pot that's probably costing over a thousand pounds anyway because they're hard to get these palms at any big size to be honest in recent years uh so yeah i'll go for something sort of at least sort of 10 liters 10 to 30 liters something like that i wouldn't go for something in a, a huge pot and i wouldn't go for anything less than three liters or five liters so 10 liters i think mine was in a 10 liter pot when i got mine and that was well over like well, 10 years ago now now it's got a decent sized trunk at the base but it's still not got a full-on proper trunk that's like you know going vertically it's still bulking up and getting wider and wider even after um well it's been in the ground now for about six seven years and it's very happy in the ground it pushes out between five and ten leaves so it actually grows a lot of leaves every year and it's starting to grow already we've already had a leaf out it grows pretty much it doesn't grow as quick as trachycarpus fortunii but it seems to push out leaves all year round even in winter just extreme slowly in winter it does grow you know as soon as it gets to temperatures like we're getting at the moment it will start motoring Get the first full leaf out in april pretty much every year so yeah go for as big as you can afford without being a huge old specimen to being lying in the back of a nursery for years unless you get a really good deal and then be careful of the roots you do not want to start breaking up the roots of a bryomata so when you get out of the pot literally get it out and don't start either pulling or teasing any roots or cutting through the roots literally get it plant it and don't mess about with the roots because if you cut too many roots they die back so the roots that you cut will literally die back to the base of the palm 
um, and then it will have to regrow new roots from the base of the palm and that can take a long time and in worst case scenario you can kill a bryomata by cutting through too many roots and disturbing it too much um, and it might take a long 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 time to realize you've done this in a huge plant because it'll have you know it'll have energy reserves in the base of the plant to keep it looking good for three four five years even but you might have actually killed it when you planted it in the past so don't cut through the roots of a, a bryomata um, hi and clap thanks for watching hope you're enjoying the uh, question and answers so far if you've got any questions throw them in the chat uh, next question do I grow any exotic fruit plants or trees um, I probably do um, but I don't get fruit on them because of where they're planted or because of my location so I do have a loquat tree which I've class as tropical fruits even though it's a hardy tree to be honest but you need really warm long hot summers to get them to fruit and mine's flowered but it's it's not in a position where it's going to do well for fruiting even in long hot summers because I'm growing it in pretty much shade and growing it in shade because I'm not bothered about the fruits and flowers and growing it for the foliage and you have deeper darker and more importantly bigger leaves if you grow your loquat in shade so to me it looks more exotic and tropical because I've got big uh, single leaves on them and the evergreen as well so that's why I grow it in the shade if you grow it in the sun it still grows really well and you've got more chance of it flowering and fruiting um, i'm growing it for the leaves i grow what else i grow my chocolate vine again that's a hardy plant but it has beautiful flowers which are just starting to emerge now and smell really nice like vanilla and a bit like chocolate as well and the fruits on the chocolate vine are well they're unusual to say the least the bright purpley blue and they hang down like big bunches of sort of like purple sausages basically and then they open up a bit like passion fruits and you eat the pulp around the seeds which tastes absolutely gorgeous but the seeds are just full of seeds so you can't really enjoy eating it because you just sort of get a mouthfuls of seed all the time but the flesh around the seeds just tastes absolutely gorgeous um i think i do have um the type of guava the hardy guava but again, I've only got one plant, and I think you need two plants to get it to fruit. So that's not looking good for me at the moment. But it's a nice evergreen bush that I grow down the bottom of the garden, which I'm probably not shown in my videos, but it's sort of a bit nondescript. But it does sort of hide the fence a bit. And if I had another plant in a nice long hot summer, then you would get some beautiful fruit on that. Annuals obviously I grow as well, so cucumbers, tomatoes and all that sort of thing like a lot of gardeners grow which are exotic because, well they're tropical at least because of very very tender plants. Let's have a look. Hi Stephen, your question is about gingers. So how easy are hardy gingers to grow from seed and best method? I've tried from the past few years with no germination. Any advice would be great. So not all hardy gingers will come true from seed and even have viable seeds. Sometimes you'll just get little seeds, well like pseudo seeds, they're not true fertilized seeds and they won't actually sprout whatever you do, whatever method you use. Um, so you need to get one that's obviously been pollinated well, has a seed in the tiny little fruits and once you've got that seed and sow it fresh ideally like i mentioned earlier you want fresh seeds for gingers to get good germination rates and then decent light so don't really cover them keep them moist and keep them about sort of 20 degrees and they should germinate pretty quickly well really quickly to be honest if they're fresh um but again yeah you need viable seeds to start with it's a bit like um uh, well, other plants that you think have grown seeds but they haven't. So sometimes you can get cannas, uh, and you got like the uh, like Tropicana series, which looks like the, the setting seed, but they'll never germinate because they're not they're not uh, fertilized seeds. They're just sort of like the shells of seeds with no actual embryo inside. Um, and it's the same with some gingers as well. You think you've got seeds, but they're just a, a variety that's normally propagated vegetatively by offsets and division rather than seeds so make sure it is a type that is got viable seeds and then uh, yeah 20 degrees 
moist and not much compost on the top and ideally surface so and then uh, keep it in good light and good luck with germination of your, your gingers okay so next question is from uh, Derek's Cheshire Palm Garden UK hi Derek hope you're doing well um, you are in the process of buying a Jubeopsis my question is how hardy do you think it is and do you think it'll be okay planted out if I protected it during the winter now I would probably say it's not hardy uh, where we live I'm saying that because I know it's a pretty rare palm but I don't know anybody who has one um, correct me if I'm wrong uh, put in the comments below right now if you know somebody who's got a Jubeopsis planted out in the UK and growing well because I don't know of anybody that is um, so I can't give any advice on that it's not a palm I've grown don't know much about it to be honest so yeah you would need to report back to us if you when you buy this and see how it goes in your garden but I'm guessing because it's not a plant we really know much about generally in, in UK gardens that it's probably probably not hardy but we'll we'll leave that for another day let's see let's see if it is so you'll have to report back Derek if you find that you can grow this palm well in the uh, the uh, the northwest of the UK okay next question uh, Palm Exotic UK hi there um, do I have any major plans for this year okay so I do have plans for future years and um, this year so my plan will be to well a couple of things I've got a full bed at the bottom of the garden on the right hand side where two, well, about three years ago my huge Chiskea Gigantia bamboo flowered itself to death and set seed all over that part of the garden so I've got a big area which is the dying roots of that palm uh, of that bamboo which covered a big area and i've got loads and loads of seedlings as well that's covered the beds around that area so my plan this year will be to dig up all the seedlings because you know they're two or three years old now they do have deep roots which is unusual for bamboos so we'll see uh, how deep they go on these two or three year old specimens i'm going to pop them up i'm going to keep a few because it's been grown from seed there should be some variation so we should see some that will grow like the parent plant and we should see some that grow either shorter or taller or have some sort of other slight variation compared to the parent plant so i'll keep a few that look a bit different from each other and the rest of them i'll sell on my open days in august um, so if you're looking for a, a pretty rare bamboo chiskea it is a clump forming one but I'll say this uh, carefully it's clump forming but it's huge so it will grow a huge clump so it's a bamboo that will grow very very tall generally and it will get wide you need a big space for it to grow well and not overtake your garden that's why I grew it at the bottom of my garden um, so I will sell them this summer and I'll keep a few and then once I've dug them up I've got that bed to grow some different plants in so we're growing some sort of shady plants in that area but it's getting a bit shady down that bottom right hand corner now so I'll be doing that this year and then another bed sort of after my Jabea so with a very open sunny area where I've got my arid beds I've got some diamond, well, triangle shaped beds. Uh, they've got loads of Colocasia pink chinas in. And I've got one of these triangles with masses of Colocasia pink china. It's got a um, Mediterranean fan palm and it's got a Cycas revoluta in it and some other bits and pieces, Melianthus and things like that, and Euphorbia. I'm going to, I think I'm going to clear that bed of all the pink china. So there's probably. Well, I'll find out when I dig them all up, but I'm guessing there might be a thousand plants of um, pink china, individual plants, because it's just, just millions of them just all scattered about. I'm going to remove all those, 
and that's going to be a bit more low maintenance bed because I've got my water system going great um, in the summer but I want to just make that bed because the other plants are very drought tolerant you know the cycas and the, the fan palm melianthus are drought, pretty much drought tolerant because they've got the sort of the you know the silvery leaves and the, the hard leaves in terms of the cycas revoluta although it does like some nice soaking as well um, but you can cope with drought for periods I'm going to get rid of the colocasias and grow some more drought tolerant plants in that area a bit more low maintenance in that corner because it gets maximum sun and I want to sort of maximise the sun loving plants in that area and then the colocasias I'll sell them on the open days as well so there'll be hopefully hundreds of those available this year because I run out really quickly last year um, and then I'll you know, like I said it'll be so sort of it will be a true arid bed it'll be more mediterranean style planting in that area so i'll be changing that this year and then in future years ideally i want to get to a stage where i can change my wood chip paths just beyond the, the deck going to the first part of the garden to have a nice sort of patio areas and things and at the bottom of the garden i want a big sort of uh, cabin jungle cabin where i can do my videos in but it'd be a nice area to sit at the bottom of the garden as well i've kept that pretty much clear if you have if you, if you have been to my garden you'll know i've got um climbing frame and swings and stuff down the bottom for the children and the idea will be when they're you know finished using that i can build a big cabin because it's a good i've got about five by four meters to play with and um, before i hit the eucalyptus and the the bamboos and things so it's a nice big space for a nice cabin which would be good down there a long way from the house and overlooking the fields as well so that is my plan in a few years time let's see what else we've got okay another question from joe zimmerman and this is about lotus so this is basically the sort of like a tropical water lily type of plant so you need warm water to grow it in or very long warm growing season outdoors and bring it in um, it's not something I've grown I've seen a few people grow it especially in Central Europe that have got the really warm uh, you know hot summers and been able to keep it alive over winter as well by bringing it in um, beautiful stunning flowers I think for me it's probably a lot of work it might not be successful and I've got so many other plants to look after over winters. It's not something I've grown. Um, beautiful plant though. Um, the ones I've seen are sort of like, I think they're sort of pink flowers. Uh, very unusual flowers. So that's a that's an unusual sort of like water lily type of plant to, to try. Okay, next question from Fraser Mellis. And this is, uh, what is the best time to remove musa pups from the main parent plant? I would say inactive growth. I wouldn't touch it in winter. I wouldn't touch it going into you know autumn into winter, and I wouldn't touch it really now until we get proper growth. So I would wait until May, and then May and June. You can do it in July and August as well, but you've got to keep on top of the water, and it can take, you know it can be a bit harder to keep them going, keep them well watered at that time of year because they'll be trying to grow big leaves and they won't have many roots when you divide them because when you get the pups you've got to be really careful uh, you'll often find you'll think you've got a big stem coming out it's a little distance away from the main stem and you think put a spade in or a knife cut that away and you'll be fine but if you don't move away the soil from the base what you'll quite often do is just cut through the stem and you've got no roots whatsoever and that stem will do nothing it will just die away even if it's a huge you know meter two meters tall stem if you've not got any roots you can't regrow them from the stem you need to get a bit of the the rhizome or rooting area for it to actually to regrow more roots so move away all the, the soil or compost away from the base and then make sure you get some of that mother plant the main stem basal plate in there or its own roots as well from the rhizome of the of the stem you're trying to divide the offset so be careful when you are separating them and i did it last year in june uh, for my musabaju from the front garden i separated it and put it in the back garden they sulked for a long time to be honest it wasn't until well into august that they were looking happy again you know you think it's nice and warm they'll grow well but because i didn't get too much root with it and they were trying to grow big leaves because it was warm and sunny then they sort of sulked for a while 
and then once the roots were rooted into the ground then they were happy and they've come through this winter unscathed thankfully it did take a little while so make sure you get roots when you do separate them you can you like i said you can if you really want to do it in in autumn and winter if you're sort of doing it and bring it indoors but i wouldn't divide a plant in sort of autumn and winter outside move it about outside because you want that rooting process to really get established before winter before it goes dormant again okay next question is from liam payne hi liam uh, my Musa Valentina has all died over winter. I didn't overwinter it correctly. Will it come back this spring? It still seems solid at the base. Thanks. Um, probably not. And you obviously need to know more about the conditions you you keep it in over winter. But this isn't a hardy type of Musa. It is tender, so you need to keep it indoors, well above frost free. You know, ideally above 10 degrees and inactive growth through winter really it can go a bit dormant ish but not really below 10 degrees um it might seem solid at the base so you might you might got some life in it if it you know you didn't actually get it really cold over winter but it could but still be solid and just not rotted away and it might slowly rot away when it warms up or it might have some life and it. it's really hard to see without any photographs or more information um, but it is a tender plant so if it looks dead and you've kept it warm for the last few weeks and it's not showing any signs of life then unfortunately it might it might be dead um okay next question paul nixon what got into tropical plants so uh, i mentioned this before but for those that don't know i grew all sorts of plants for all my life uh it started with fruit and veg when i was very young like literally four or five i've grown fruit and veg every year uh, and i moved into tropical plants so when I got my own garden in 2004, I think it was, or 2005, when I got my own garden, uh, then I started with tropical plants. So I, I grew, basically. I went to Wilkinson's that, that spring, and they had loads of tropical bulbs. They had elephant ears. They had the uh, colocasias you could buy from there, giant ones, like mammoth, I think it was, and they had loads of obviously dahlias and things like that. And I just picked one of everything, put them in the garden, and everything grew. And also there was Musa Baju from my local garden centre that first year, and I got that, and I've grown that same plant or the the pups of that plant since then. Um, so it's been you know what's that, 17 years I've been growing those. So they are great. Not 15 years, 16 years, can't count. Um, so I've been growing tropical plants for a long, long time and gardening now for 35 years. As I'm coming up to I'll be 40 soon. So yeah, I'm, uh, I've been gardening for quite a long time. Okay, next question from Keith Harris. Hi, Keith. Um, about Trachycarpus. Last summer, my new fronds were stunted, had brownish mould on them. I noticed red mites too. I treated it. Uh, any thoughts? So, Trachycarpus fortunii and Wanderanus, the hardy fan palms that we grow all over sort of Europe, but Northern Europe and the UK, they are pretty much bulletproof once they're happy in your garden. So once they've got the roots down, they will survive, you know, even pretty bad winters. Um, and they don't need lots of heat to grow well. They need a decent amount of water. They don't want to be too too hot for too long with too humidity so they're not a palm you could grow in florida very well uh, but you can grow lots of other types of palms in florida but in the uk they grow well so you say you've got an issue with uh, stunted foliage this could be depending on when you planted it did you mention that in your question last summer my new fronds were stunted so i don't know when you planted it it could be that it's just suffering from shock of being moved or it wasn't growing well in a pot before you planted it out in the last two or three years it can take depending on how it's been transplanted it can take three or four years for it to be in you know full growth again if it had a bad transplant normally we say you know a year or two and it should be growing well but it depends if it was uh, dug up from somebody else's garden and then brought to your garden and not watered well in its first year it can sort of suffer so it's like any sort of plant any trees once you plant it in the ground You've got to water it 
through the first year really well so especially in spring and summer and into autumn where it's it can be dry and can get you know weeks without any proper rain you need to water it really really well in its first year once you've got through the first year or so the roots will have got into the ground and it will find its own water and you don't really need to water it again it could be something to do with that it could be the opposite it could be where you've planted it it's sort of in a, a sump it could be some really sort of waterlogged ground and it might be that it's sort of suffering from sitting in waterlogged conditions and the roots are rotting under there it's hard to to say without without seeing the pictures and knowing the growing conditions exactly and you get mold basically on dying and dead leaves as well so that's that's that the red mites i don't think will be anything to do with why it's looking bad unless I mean, we talk about red spider mite, but red spider mite is generally not actually red. It's normally sort of clear to little brown. It's very rarely that red and they're very, very small and don't affect outdoor plants very often on hardy sort of tough plants like a Trachyapus fortunii, unless it had them when it was growing indoors and brought outside. But generally speaking, once it's gone through a winter, it kills off any red spider mites anyway because they don't like it frosty. They won't survive frosty conditions. So you normally get it indoors in greenhouses. So it's probably not that affecting it. It's probably, like I said, something wrong with the roots, I would say. Either been too dry or they've been too wet for too long. They can cover a lot of water. You know, they can, damp conditions are fine. But if they're literally sitting in water, then they won't be happy. But it's hard to say, Keith, without knowing the exact location and what's been going on with that plant. So Joe Zimmerman again, hi Joe, thanks for the questions this evening, asking about other collocations at Hardy, uh, other than Pink China. There are a few you can try that are hardy-ish, but not thoroughly hardy. So the general um, Mammoth and Jack's Giant can get through winters, Darkstem Hybrid, Fontensii can get through winters, but they're not reliably hardy. They're normally you know get through mild ones if it's been well drained but they don't grow quickly again the next year to make a good sized plant in my garden so in america uh, they do keep most of the collocages out even in really cold winters if they've mulched heavily because they have proper heat like 30 degrees in summer for days and weeks at, at a time they'll grow back grow, grow back well so you can grow far more collocages in the ground although we have milder winters than most of continental europe uh, continental europe and uh, america because it's mild because we've got maritime climate we don't have that intense summer heat normally to get them into growth uh, well enough the pink china is one of the exceptions it doesn't need too much heat to get going again and it's reasonably hardy there is the other one that i can never pronounce beginning with j uh, g that is hardy as well they're like gail gangosis or something like that so that is hardy as pink china. I've got a small plant that I'll be planting out this spring in the garden and hopefully it will bulk up over the next few years and it will compete with the pink china for a nice hardy colocasia and the golgansis. I've not got it spelt in front of me. One beginning with G, look it up. It's uh, It's got sort of like dark shades, like patches of blacky brown on the leaves. So it's, it does look different from pink china. So it's a nice contrasting collocation to try that is harder in the UK. So that's the other one. But you, other people have tried other ones like I mentioned. Mammoth and Jack Giant will get through some winters, but not every winter if it's especially wet or cold. Uh, John Watts asked about Lassio Carpa. We talked about that much earlier in the hour. Um, so yeah, Lassio Carpa, I like to grow it as a pot plant to be honest. It's not a big banana, it'll never grow huge, so I don't see the point of planting it out. Grow it in a pot, you can bring it in over winter so you're not having to worry about protecting it outside. It doesn't take up much space and you get them to flower after, I don't know, two to four years, they will flower. They are monocarpic, so they will die after flowering, but have loads of offsets that you can divide and grow on as well. The flowers are stunning. Uh, and I did film, I did a time-lapse movie of them flowering as well, which you might want to check out. All the, the petals unfurling over several weeks. It's a, a beautiful, large flower that lasts for absolutely ages. Um, 
do you grow any pounds from seeds so yeah i have done in the past the one i keep trying with is uh Juanita australis so i've got some more seeds and a go of that in uh, moss and that a uh, they are not germinating yet put them in i think november december time they've not gone mushy they've not gone moldy they're still firm and hard so i'm giving it more time to see if they germinate i had them germinate before but they're really tricky once you get them to germinate to keep them alive for too long um they had one do okay and then die at the first leaf stage so i want to try to get them to grow i've grown loads of trachyapas fortunae i've grown washingtonias from seed i've tried bootias and jabayas before but they didn't germinate for me and i found that you know they are very slow from seed and i bought plants uh, rather than trying those types from seed again but definitely washes are easy to grow dates are very very easy to grow from fe uh, fresh seeds and i've grown them a few times but if you've got something really rare uh, and you want to try it, then seed's the best way to go because it's easy to, to find it from seed in the first place. And, you know, you get a bunch of seeds. And as long as, you, you know, you've got patience, uh, you should see some germinate, but they can take years. Some people have grow, tried to grow palms from seeds, grown it in moss or in a Ziploc bag and given it ideal conditions they've read about and they've not germinated. They've thrown them outside in the summer and then they've found that they've germinated just outside on the ground so don't give up uh, sometimes it can take a year or two to, to germinate as well what else we got so nigel phillips asks are there any plants you hope and try for the first time this year yes there are quite a few this year last year i hardly grew anything new I sort of sort of looking after the plants i had uh, but this year I'm growing a type of, sort of daisy-like flower, but it's a foliage I'm after. It's got several names. Uh, the one I'm going to use in this video, because I remember it, is Rolanda. I think it's Senecio as well. And it's basically got very interesting furry leaves uh, with sort of like scalloped edges. Uh, I did a picture of it on Instagram and Facebook uh, yesterday, if you want to check that out. It's, yeah, it's, it should be hardy as well. So I'm going to be planting that out in spring and sort of treating it a bit like sort of Amicia and sort of Tetrapanax in terms of it's just, it will die back in winter and it'll come from the, the roots each spring. And that's a plan anyway. I got it as a cutting last year um, and hopefully it will do well. And it looks really unusual. You can get a red form as well. Um, but the green form, I believe, should be pretty hardy. So that will be one I'm trying for the first time. And I'll also be growing, well, be growing different varieties of things like zinnias for the first time. But I'll be growing um, perella, I think it's called perella, from seed, which is like a red, it's a red edible, it's a herb. But it has sort of really dark foliage. So that will be like really nice contrast to grow. It looks tropical-ish and it'll be good contrast with like yellow and green and red uh, flowering plants and leaves. So I'll be growing that from seeds. I literally just put the seed in last night. So I sowed a load of seeds last night. I sowed all my zinnias. I sowed all my ricinus now into uh, April. I sowed, what else did I sow? Look, like I said, about five or six types of zinnias. Two types of ricinus and some other things I can't quite remember now as well. Uh, oh yeah, Tophonia seeds, my Mexican sunflowers, I saw mm -hmm. them as well. So all the things that you know grow quickly but are tender, I'm starting to, to grow from seed into April into May. Um, let's have a look, what else have we got? We're nearly up to the hour, I like to finish within the hour, so we're we'll finishing at 8 o'clock. Let's see what else we got. Okay, so we've got SFO two K one. Hello, how much growth can you expect on my new gunner in its first year? It currently has four uh, four hand sized leaves. So, if it's a new one and you put it in the ground now, it will grow to a decent size but it'll be mainly sort of building up its root system and getting sort of a bit of mass sort of underground and getting those buds 
big for next year's growth. Um, and it also depends which gunner you've got, whether you've got Manicata or you've got Tinctoria. If you've got Tinctoria, you'll never get leaves more than meter, meter and a half across, which is big. It's still a huge plant. Uh, but for the absolute massive biggest leaves you want manicata which can easily get well over well over two meters across on stalks at about two meters three meters no, might be exaggerating a bit but at least two and a half meters tall as well so it can be huge so you want manicata for the biggest ones of potentially both though when you first plant it will you know it might get leaves are about a meter across at the biggest in the first year i would say but from a small plant obviously you might be looking at 40 50 60 centimeters it's really hard to say give it loads of water loads of water loads of uh, feed if you wish as well loads of manure and things like that and it will grow big if you've got manicata it'll grow bigger still but tinctoria is still a big plant although strictly speaking it's not legal to sell tinctoria in uh, in the UK and Europe because of its uh, potential for being invasive in parts of Europe like Western Ireland and, uh, and continental Europe as well. Okay, time for a couple more questions. Okay, so we have uh, Vincenzi's asking again, but this one is about Juan Australis. I've met him. Funny enough, you're talking about this. I have germinated uh, Juanita australis from seed before, but I didn't get past the first leaf stage. It sort of died back. I think it's quite temperamental when it's first putting its uh, first root and its first leaf out. So that is why I'm trying again. First time I grew them from seed, they did germinate pretty well within like a month to six weeks. Uh, this time it's been a few months and I've got no germination and I've done pretty much the same thing. So hopefully they'll germinate and keep constant temperatures I think but not too warm. There are These are a bit strange for palm trees, they like cool conditions. They don't want to have hot summers so again continental Europe, continental America they don't grow well if at all because it's too hot for them. It's said that anything over 25 degrees for many days at a time will mean the palms will go sort of dormant and sort of die back a bit potentially. They don't like hot temperatures. So the UK is great if you can get it through the winters because we never get many weeks where it's above 25 degrees. We normally, you know, summers, especially up in the north, we get 20 degrees is great. 25 is uh, rare uh, and 30 degrees is like once a year, if at all, we'll get to 30 degrees. So it's great for our summers for Juan Australis. Winters, you don't really want it below zero, but they can cope down to minus five, minus six, um, and maybe a bit lower when established as well. So hopefully we'll get some grown from seed this year, and we'll just talk about the experience of uh, growing these on throughout the, the UK summer. So one more question before we wrap up for the evening, and that again let's try let's see Diane Cox are there any common diseases of gingers outdoors my pot grown ones sometimes have large brown patches over the leaves and not sure why I found all the gingers that I grow outdoors to be pretty much fuss free they don't really get attacked by any pests or diseases slugs really don't go from much sometimes you get moths uh, nibbling away at them but that's about it um, and I've never had any diseases. They are related to obviously the bananas and the cannas, which do suffer quite a lot of diseases, especially the cannas. But I've not noticed any diseases on my uh, different hedicums um, in the garden. And I've been growing them for like 10 15 years, so I can't really comment on diseases. But become you know, plants become more and more commonly grown uh, gingers then chances are diseases will spread eventually and we'll find that there are plants you know certain gingers that will uh, be susceptible to, to diseases but at the moment I don't, I don't know any of any uh, common uh, diseases that attack or affect uh, hedicums in the garden brown patches 
yeah, I'm not seeing it because in summer you can give them endless amounts of water and it won't do them any harm whatsoever. It can be completely, pretty much, not as a bog plant, but it can water them every day in summer and they will do well as long as it's warm. They love loads of water and loads of feed. Um, so I wouldn't say that would be causing it to have brown patches on the leaves. Um, so I'm not sure why you've got that Diane, so sorry I can't help you that one, just have to monitor it and, and see how it, uh, see if it affects the same plants year after year or was it a one off. So we have come up to the hour, thanks for everybody for tuning in and watching and asking loads of really interesting questions, hopefully I've answered most of them well, a lot about my personal gardening and gardening style and about me but lots of general gardening questions there as well um, if you've managed not to see this from the start i will be doing a full video of this onto youtube a little bit later this evening so you can watch the full show from the beginning or fast forward and rewind to your heart's content uh, so thank you for watching and join me next week we'll be doing more in the garden bye for now